Good evening, everyone, once again, and thank you so much for joining us on this 10th session under the Masterclass series. Over the past few weeks, in fact, few months, we have traversed across topics uh, right from liberal arts in a management context to emotional intelligence in the work. Uh, so I thought it would be one of the best decisions to now bring a strategy. Uh, this would also be our last session for the season for Masterclass, and I don't think it's a better topic to end rather than strategy as such. We've always heard from a lot of authors like Robert Greene, who've always sort of um, drawn parallels between what happens in the battlefield. Uh, there have been anecdotes of World War II, World War I, which today companies are sort of understanding and applying them onto their corporate boardrooms. And today's session is very much on the same thing which talks about from battlefield to corporate boardrooms. And to deal with this session, I have with Professor Neeraj Mankar. Uh, Professor Mankar is the Assistant Dean for Program Display uh, with more than two decades of experience across academia and industry. I think STIR has been headlining strategy across various organizations as well as its claim. And I am really, really uh, fortunate to have him do this concluding session for us for the Masterclass as well. Uh, sir, I'm not going to take up too much time. I think uh, we are waiting to understand how we can replicate the war scenario within corporate boardrooms as well and learn from you more. Thank you so much. Please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Anju. Uh, indeed, a pleasure to be back again here uh, for the for the masterclass series uh, and and the culmination of the uh, the second series of masterclass here with the. Uh, webinar 10 here. So Anju, thank you very much for uh, pushing me and coaching me and cajoling me to you know, always a pleasure. <laughs> here today. Always my pleasure. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm pretty happy and when uh, you know when Anju uh, told me about uh, this uh, uh, over the last uh, uh, perhaps a year and a half or two years I've been quite interested in this uh, topic uh, and trying to figure out uh, if there are parallels and, and so on. And moreover, uh, a small anecdote on you before I, I begin here. I think the inspiration comes from, uh, you know, my 12-year-old uh, son who has by now become uh, perhaps he, an expert on World War II, uh, an expert on how uh, military strategy is happening. And I'm, I'm quite motivated by him. And, and when he keeps on watching his YouTube videos and when he keeps on uh, talking about this as a 12-year-old keeps on chattering on, I realized that uh, perhaps there is something that uh, we would learn. And that's when uh, over a year or so, I started looking at, uh, you know, how, how strategy and these are parallels. And uh, we have been over the last, uh, uh, you know, a uh, couple of decades, there has been a lot of work that has been done. Uh, a lot of people have been speaking about uh, you know, connections between uh, military strategy and uh, business strategy as such, uh, though, uh, you know, they both both are, are widely different in terms of the environments that they deal with, uh, the nuances that they deal with, but perhaps it's, uh, there is a possibility of uh, some parallels coming in. And as we go along, perhaps, uh, you know, to all of the attendees who are here, uh, I might be able to, you know, make some sense, hopefully, and uh, give you some parallels which to take through. But uh, please be mindful that this is just a maybe uh, a 40 minute or 40, 45 minute or the uh, session and therefore uh, not too detailed, but I'll, I'll try and perhaps give you a flavor of what happens and maybe, you know, many of you might be wanting to go ahead and, and take a look at uh, it more, more in detail as we go along. <clears throat> So, uh, Anju, with your permission, I may uh, begin. <coughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. <clears throat> and uh, before I begin, I, I see in the in the participant list, Anju, a, a couple of uh, uh, experts from both the uh, both the arenas, if you may. Uh, we have uh, my good old friend, uh, Captain Dankar here, who is also joined in. Thank you, Anil. Uh, for joining in, he's been a captain in the Indian Army and now, uh, you know, heading a couple of ventures here. So I'm, I'm sure it'll be interesting, I mean, to have your uh, insights as well. So it's going to be great with a couple of them I can recognize uh, here. Uh, so let, let's hope I'm able to do 
uh, some amount of justice to what you require. <clears throat> so let me let me begin uh, this uh, session with. <clears throat> so the format that I have tried to figure out, and it really did take me some time to understand. Uh, how do I how do I link these two together, and what way? So I'm going to talk about uh, two or three different scenarios, two or three different battles, which are. Uh, sort of historic and perhaps uh, most of us, if not all of us, are aware of uh, these battles and these uh, <clears throat> uh, military maneuvers there, and then try to somehow, uh, you know, link this with uh, some of the uh, learnings that strategy uh, researchers or strategy formulation uh, folks can have in terms of what they would be able to uh, gain out of this. <clears throat> Uh, to end with, uh, I will give you some examples from the corporate field, uh, linking what you have seen in, uh, in, in these three scenarios that I will present, uh, and uh, hopefully there will be connects that we will be able to make from this. Uh, so the first uh, of the battles is an iconic battle uh, during the Napoleonic Wars, uh, which is the Battle of, of Trafalgar. Uh, and the Battle of Trafalgar, which, which uh, happened in uh, 1805 uh, between Napoleon, who commanded uh, <clears throat> a fleet of uh, uh, ships. Napoleon, at that point of time, those of you who are aware, uh, had conquered most of Europe uh, and had his uh, eyes on the conquest of Great Britain. Uh, he, he wanted to uh, take over the entire uh, British uh, island there. Uh, to do that, he had to he had to come in from the sea, from the ocean. <clears throat> and uh, the difficulty there was that the British army were the British uh, were the the champions, or if you may, the conquerors of the ocean. Uh, since long, they were the ones who won wars there because uh, they were mightily experienced and had great amount of uh, experience in in uh, naval warfare from that side. Uh, but in the Battle of Trafalgar, the, the British uh, Navy, uh, English Navy at that point of time, uh, was uh, uh, highly, uh, you know, outnumbered in terms of the Spanish and French fleet that Napoleon uh, commanded. Uh, at that point of time, uh, the British uh, commander there, uh, Lord Nelson, was a very well decorated uh, hero who had who had won. A lot of uh, wars before uh, he had driven off uh, a lot of uh, naval uh, conquests who uh, were trying to come to Britain back uh, to their waters. And so he was a very celebrated hero. And, and uh, what I want you to focus on is, is take a look at what, what, <clears throat> what were the challenges uh, out there. Uh, the challenges for the British here was that there were 27 ships. Uh, I'm not getting into too many details at this point of time. You, you should go ahead and, and do a lot of research on this if you wish. But what was important here was that clearly from a resource perspective, I'm going to use these words, the British fleet was outnumbered. <clears throat> and everyone uh, on the British side, including Lord Nelson, feared that this would be uh, perhaps a stumbling block for them. But Lord Nelson uh, devised a careful strategy. And the way in which the strategy was formulated, created, uh, is going to be explained to us in this particular video that I'm going to show. Uh, it's a very beautiful video, which comes from <clears throat> History News Answers. It tells us about what happened in that era. At 248 years old, HMS Victory is the oldest commissioned warship in the world. She's most famous as Lord Admiral Horatio Nelson's flagship in the Battle of Trafalgar in 1805, when the British Royal Navy was up against the combined fleets of the French and Spanish. 
Victory is a first-rate line of battle ship. She carries 104 guns spread across three decks. Whilst there are some very large ships in the French and Spanish fleet, the majority of them are two-deckers, smaller ships, so Victory would tower over them. But although Admiral Nelson commanded superior ships like the Victory, he actually had fewer ships than the enemy. We know we have to take an enemy line, and at Trafalgar, these, we are talking about 33 French and Spanish ships of the line. Nelson has only 27. So his challenge is to remove a portion of the enemy fleet to even the odds. Nelson devises an ingenious plan using an incredibly unorthodox naval strategy. The established tactic of the day was to engage the enemy fleet in a single line of battle, parallel to the enemy. Nelson ignores this and commands his ships on a perpendicular attack. He divides the British fleet into two parallel columns and pushes them towards the French and Spanish line, which is spread out across the horizon. It's five miles wide. So he wants to split the enemy into three chunks. By breaking the enemy formation into three, Nelson creates what he calls a pell-mell battle. He separates the middle of the fleet from the front and annihilates many ships before the front line can turn back. The front half were piled by wind. By the time they realize what has happened, they're gonna have to turn around and beat into the wind. Very difficult to do with a sailing ship. But there was enormous risk in the strategy. Leading the charge face on, the victory was open to the broadside cannons of the enemy line. We have the best part of 15 or 16 ships who are concentrating all their guns on victory and on victory's bows. So she's very heavily battered at the front. The sails are cut through, the steering wheel's shot away, a lot of uh, damage is done to the hull. The upper decks are raked almost continuously by fire for a couple of hours. So they're a scene of absolute destruction. She's very, very badly damaged indeed. But the victory cuts the enemy line. The British ships overwhelm the center and rear enemy guard. And though Nelson is mortally wounded, he witnesses victory before taking his last breath. And HMS Victory lives up to her name, leading the most decisive British naval victory in the war. So, what was it that was that was so different? The formation, and they spoke about the formation being unorthodox. <clears throat> as as naval strategy in, in that time, the ships when when they went uh, to battle with each other. They formed a single line linearly and they confronted each other. And this is something which Lord Nelson realized that they do not have a chance of victory if they used this conventional method. And therefore, he devised this two column strategy. Very, very unconventional that time. Of a very, uh, it, it was high risk. But in the end, they managed, and, and <clears throat> there were uh, quite a number of ships which they captured, they came back with, they won without losing any of their own ships. So I think, why was this possible? What is the learning that we have uh, as, as people who look at strategy? Insight, moving the pivot, thinking differently and out of the box. Out of the box, we always talk about in, in the corporate world. But here is an example from uh, Lord Nelson in the 1800s. Thinking out of the box, it takes courage, it takes risk, it more importantly requires you to identify one or two crucial issues that are there to be addressed. 
And if you are able to figure out those crucial issues and focus your resources and actions on them, that's a good strategy that, that works. Lord Nelson also had this uh, interesting way of communicating. And I mentioned communicate, 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 because I can't stress enough on this. As a leader, you must communicate what your strategy is. He had what was called as three parties with, with the commanders of each of those vessels. Where he explained to them, he outlined to them. He got them thinking about this, getting them on the same understanding that he himself was. And that's where you see how Britain won this particular battle. And the three learnings that you would get from this victory. Let's look at the other one, <clears throat> the Gulf War. Many of you might have, uh, might be remembering the Gulf War uh, in the 90s when uh, the infamous Saddam Hussein Gaddafi uh, took over Kuwait on 2nd of August, invaded and occupied Kuwait. Uh, multiple reasons for why he did that, what he did that, but that's not of interest for us. And the allied forces, 33 coalition nations, started air tracks. Iraq increased its ground forces. At, at some point of time, it was estimated to be 540,000 men, 4,000 of the 5,000 tanks that they had, plus other armored vehicles. They also had the advantage of sort of the environment that they were conducive, they were, they were aware of, they had fought before in that environment. And General, at that point of time, General Scott Paul, he was the one who devised, who, who was leading uh, the US uh, coalition. And he devised this strategy. You first went in for an air attack, and then there was a left hook. What did you do? This was this was the time. So if I'm if I may to give you uh, a minute of background on what happened at that point of time, was that the U.S. allies using air attacks or using their massive resources of combined ground forces would have definitely overthrown the Iraqi at that point of time. But what would have been the collateral damage? It would have, it was estimated to be extremely high. And therefore, the, the, uh, the first option of attack, the ground forces, the ground attack was feasible, but not preferred because of the loss of lives on the US side it would have. <clears throat> there was no doubt in anybody's mind that they would capture it. But at what cost? And therefore, while the entire media, while the entire world was focused on that uh, one part of ground attack which they had thought the Allied forces would, would make, here was a deviation that General looked at. The air attacks continued. The air attacks uh, resulted in the, the Iraqi uh, army not able to you know, make use of their tanks because they would have come out in the open, uh, easy uh, targets. Other armored vehicles, so it restricted to a large extent uh, what what they could do, and why at that point of time <clears throat> the left hook came. And what's the left hook? It's something in military strategy that's called an envelopment strategy. What you see here <clears throat> you 
these apparts <clears throat> were the ones where the Iraqi forces were present. What General did was he shifted 250,000 men west of Kuwait on this side. Here. And then moved them further down towards Iraq and moved them a little north. Once they began this attack, the shaping operations, which it was called. This force, which moved on to north, launched the left hook. And they, they surprised uh, the enemy where they were least expected to come in. And that is actually how the, the Iraqis were completely surprised as to what was happening. So, it's what was the result of this? Envelopment is known to everyone, both the sides, the Iraqis knew it. Uh, every, every, everybody uh, was aware of this as a strategy. But what worked well was the su successful deception. The manner in which the, the news media was focused only on the actual place of battle and was not aware of what was happening at the other end. That is successful deception. It's a surprise element that is given. But it is not that easy a strategy to, to, to implement because you needed collaboration. General needed collaboration from all those 33 allied nations which were, were part of uh, their coalition. They needed from, from the air attack team collaboration. They needed collaboration from a host of stakeholders and they needed that one. So the learning from this that you get and, and, and uh, it's a very condensed version of, of what actually happened. So uh, I think there is much more to uh, the reasons why this was, but uh, the envelopment was perhaps one of the turning points of uh, the strategy. And that's another learning which we will, as we go ahead, I, I will point out to you that a strategy needs to be incomplete. It's not an individual element. The third, many of you would have heard this. Mm -hmm. It's a story which we, we all hear. Uh, it's a, it's a biblical uh, parable uh, story coming in, which talks about how uh, the mighty Goliath was defeated by a shepherd boy. And I, I'll just show you what happened. I'm sure uh, this might be known to many of you here. Let me Share with you. <clears throat> to secure the promised land, the Israelites must defeat the Philistines. The King Saul has lost God's blessing. And now he faces the Philistines' greatest champion, Goliath. Jonathan. The warrior who defeats him will be a rich man. Not one man in Israel. Not one of God's people.
I'll do it. David. You're no soldier, you're a shepherd. Yes, a shepherd. As I protect my sheep, God will protect me. Where is your faith? Where is your God? I will kill him. You'll need this. I'll be better without it. Yea, though I walk in the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. For you are with me. Thy rod and staff, they comfort me. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. So here is the, the mighty <clears throat> falling against the shepherd boy. So what could you learn? And then uh, just please, uh, you, you may want to go ahead, uh, you know, putting your comments on the chat. I think the chat box is, is open. Uh, feel free to feel free to participate. Uh, add up here. But what? I mean, one part of what he said, my God is there with me and, and all of that, but let's look at it from uh, a strategic perspective. What did David do? I think the first point that you must try to, uh, I would like to point here, is that he had the courage. He had the motivation, he had the need to do that. Point two, what, if you have seen the video very carefully, you would have seen that he was offered an armor, but he declined that armor. Why? Because it would have made him slow. And he realizes that with that armor, if the mighty Goliath is going to attack him, there is no way that armor is going to defend him in any ways. So it's pointless. Keep yourself light. <clears throat> he realizes that the only part of the giants, Goliaths, armored figure that is unprotected and he attacks that part. So, what do we learn from this? 
relative strength can help in overcoming relative weaknesses what was david's strength if i if i do a typical swot analysis which we do in strategy strength weaknesses what is david's strength he is he is motivated uh, he is courageous but is that the strength highly skilled slinger his skill is in the aim that he is able to get his skill is in is 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 in the way in which he is able to fling the stone at the right spot with the right amount of force that would require his enemy to be out he got a strategic advantage which we in companies try to figure out what that advantage is and we try many many a times you've heard of of uh, corporates companies talking about advantages competitive advantages what was david's advantage highly skilled slinger he knew where to focus on and he put that focus into use so these are three instances that i have spoken about mm. and 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 there are multiple if one does Uh, if one is interested in this you could go ahead and take a look at perhaps uh, any of the major battlefields that you could think of you could look at the mahabharata look at what krishna spoke about in in the gita a lot of strategy comes out learnings come out in both of them one can look even uh, at at recent Uh, victories that we've had when it when it came to uh, the Kargil it's all about how the strategy is formulated i could go into a lot of details about each one of these and and try and focus on on what went there and how the entire but but in in the interest of time let's move ahead how do we navigate strategy what do we think their four strategy is we've seen these three instances of a clearly under resourced navy of a clearly largely resourced us force against a smaller army and of precise focus and skill what is strategy so strategy is all about identifying the challenge it's all about focusing and coordinating efforts you can you need to identify those challenges you need to acknowledge that these are challenges you need to spend time in understanding those challenges detailing those challenges and then focus on how you are going to overcome these challenges focus on what resources and efforts you will require and that's why as strategy researchers we think it's extremely difficult task to uh, to look at a good strategy arriving at a good strategy because it's a it's a laborious effort it requires large uh, you know so uh, uh, intense work in understanding what you do where you are what you have what are your skills your capabilities both whether it's in the battlefield or in the boat room and that's where i believe the intersection of strategy in the boat room and the battlefield happens at both these what you are trying to do is identify what your challenges are so some of the the examples that i may want to give you from how how uh, you know military strategy uh, comes in you know in marketing you have a flanking strategy competitive strategy uh, takes a lot of learning from from uh, military and uh, mm. strategy 
envelopment strategy. Fire and move. What do you try to do when you are on the ground? And, and <clears throat> perhaps if Captain is here, he may want to you know, put it on chat. Is you've got to keep on firing and at the same time keep on moving. You fire because that's the way that you will uh, try and get at the enemy. But at the same time, you can't just fire. You've got to gain ground. The same thing happens in business. You need to have tactics. And this is where I would want to separate a strategy from a tactic. At the ground level, this is a tactic which you have, which keeps on changing as, as and when the need happens. Competitive intelligence is all about the right kind of tactics in the environment, competitive environment. Level. In technology and in, and, and in intellectual property management, we have what we call as castle and the moat. You create castles where the valuable resources are. If you go back uh, to history and, and look at the castles that, that are there, the kings and, and the emperors would be there. And what happens to the moat? The moat makes it difficult for your competition to come in. Technology companies create a moat around them. They use intellectual property to create moats so that, so that competition cannot come to that particular castle which they have created, the technologically castle that they created. And we'll talk about this as, as we go <coughs> in, in the examples. There's protect, or in this case, patent the tree and cut the forest. What you're doing is you're focusing yourself on that one, but you are burning or cutting down the forest so that there's nothing else left for the others to work on. Companies do that. You patent the most important part of the technology and you publish all the parts around it, all, all the technology around it. It's published in the open world. And therefore, everybody has access to it. And therefore, it's not useful at all. And giving you the competitive advantage, you have the tree with you. I'm mindful of the time and the fact that <clears throat> you might have questions. So uh, I'll, I'll straight away jump to some of the examples. Let me look at Bajaj Finance. A brilliant example of a, a small David against the big colonies. But he was able to find that pot. Banks ignored consumer durable financing because they had low ticket price as also a high default and therefore were not willing. But Bajaj successfully was able to navigate that. Had they real, had they uh, tried to, that, that option would have been open to them, I'm sure. Becoming a bank and, you know, the, the similar manner in which a bank goes in. But no, we looked at that uh, niche and moved slowly into them. And then, like perhaps Nelson's strategy, you move now into core assets. And today they are there in, in, in most of the uh, business uh, financing that the other banks are into. And, and we all know the story of, of Mujahid Finance. A brilliant example. Some other examples. <clears throat> Apple versus the Wintel, Windows, Intel uh, combination which, which happened. You know, when Steve Jobs came back to Apple uh, from Pixel and he was asked to uh, join back, the Intel cartel was, was very, very, <clears throat> very strong for the point of time. <clears throat> and how did he navigate that? He waited for the right opportunity to come in. And that came in in the form of uh, the I. Uh, iPod or 
uh, iTunes really. We have no Dell in the PC business. Again, uh, the, the uh, Hoover Packards, IBMs at that time. There's an interesting, uh, but not very popular example of NVIDIA versus Intel in the graphic processing uh, unit, in the processing rather. Intel had taken over the entire uh, processor market. Their technology, uh, they were superior in that. Uh, there, there's a lot of detail into this. Uh, uh, you, could, you may want to read up a, a, a couple of uh, researchers who have, who have done work on in this, on the semiconductor industry, really. But NVIDIA found that small gap which was for GPU, graphic processor units. And they realized that that's the market where they could, they, could, they could fit in. I'm not getting into the details, but you see where today uh, NVIDIA is over the years. And there are technological challenges that uh, a graphic processing unit requires, which they were able to successfully come in. They were able to reduce uh, the time uh, that were there in, in terms of launching. Uh, Intel, you know, you may have heard of Moore's law uh, based on the former uh, Intel founder. Jenny. So NVIDIA, it did not decide to take on the mighty Goliath in its own space. It found out where are those in that entire space. Now that takes work, that takes analysis, that takes detailing, that takes a lot of effort on part of the management. But that then gives you the opportunity of going in. Mm. Finally, I would like you to look at a couple of readings which, which talk about uh, and it's very popular, Sun Tzu. Uh, the Art of War is a treatise on military strategies and warfare. A lot of uh, uh, work has been done. Uh, it's available on Google. Uh, it's available on a lot of uh, books as well, where uh, Sun Tzu's uh, 33 or even more uh, pointers are given for business strategies to look at. I would also, uh, you know, Recommend to you looking at Chankya Niti, uh, who was a teacher in Takshila. You, you all heard about him, is you know, credited for Chandragupta's rise to power, work on diplomacy, strategy, and, and so on. So there is a lot of connect that one can hear. Although these two are uh, very, very separate. But the bottom line here that I want you to take home with is the definition that we spoke about strategy. <clears throat> is the identification and challenges, identification of challenges, focusing and coordinating efforts and resources to bring about uh, a competitive advantage, which we talked about. Uh, any questions? I'm happy to answer. Thank you so much uh, for a patient journey. Yeah. Thank you so much, sir. It's indeed been a, a wonderful session in terms of understanding how strategy could be applied uh, to the copy portal. So I, I would urge the participants as well, in case if you have any questions, please use the Q&A box on screens to put in your questions and we'll take them right now. Uh, but before we go on to the audience question, um, we obviously, you know, strategy is such a vast topic, and uh, naturally there have been similarities that have been drawn across from a military warfare or military situations to the boardroom uh, till date. But what is it that makes it a difference? Uh, there have been many companies that have possibly, uh, you know, adopted successful strategies that were used in their World War II or like what. But they've not been able to succeed. So where is that? Where is that? Uh, where is the line which says that you know this is it may be strategy, but how do I make it successful? I think I think that's a a, a very pointed and a great question, Anju. If I may, uh, 
because uh, like i mentioned in one of the slides uh, as one the strategies are known to everyone what i am what i am uh, what i talked about and what you will hear in the strategy books uh, lecture sessions you will do the readings you will find that it's all open public knowledge and therefore how do you as a company uh, succeed while your competitor doesn't and that's where uh, i was trying to focus on in that definition that i said and what surrounds that is the amount of hard work the amount of detailed analysis that gets into uh, the amount of how well you are able to know yourself and your competition and your market so strategy is not about product differentiation or strategy is not about looking at a cost leadership a strategy needs to be over encompassing all these items it's also a kind of an orchestra if you may where all the different uh, types of of music musicians come together to create a holistic piece which seemingly looks uh, from the outside when i look at nvidia's strategy i think there's nothing great that they did but in order to arrive at that decision the work that has gone into it is something that we don't understand when we view it from outside but that's the amount of effort that you need to take and that's why when you look at creating strategies there's a great amount of effort that goes into it and perhaps you know successful companies are uh, motivated or they are putting in that great amount of effort all right so uh, as a follow up of this where does then uh, where do tactics figure out in this can we then very safely say that in a company which focuses uh, completely on strategy but is not supported with the right set of uh, tactics is is like a you know is like a company full of thinkers but no action as such so where does tactics come into this entire picture so i think let me go back to again uh, lord nelson right uh, you saw that video and he knew that he had 22 uh, 27 chips uh, but he also knew that the gunners that he had were perhaps the best at that point of time he also knew that the guns that he had were superior what are you doing you know you have the resources you know you may have lower resources but you also know that you have the skills to reconfigure those resources in a much better manner than the others uh, would be having now when you craft a strategy you need to have supporting tactics which seemingly help you uh, course correct at all point of time which is what happens if you go into a battlefield you may have had uh, in, in fact uh, i i don't recollect the uh, the uh, person who said this but uh, they said that all strategy uh, falls out when you are in the battle when you are actually there in front of the enemy because it's tactics that will so you do know a broad vision you do have a broad uh, kind of a, a path that you know you've got to follow but tactics is where uh, you need to change in the market as the situation develops so you've got to have combinations of both so that i mean i think and uh, it makes more much sense is that the crea complementing in a sense with each other you wouldn't be able to also execute uh, your tactical plans unless and until you have a strategy in place i think it works both the way as well yes but uh, you know a caution here and is that uh, many many uh, companies uh, look at tactics and assume that they are strategies right so lowering you know price is not a strategy it's a tactic right cost leadership becomes a strategy now when can you lower price only when you've got a cost leadership unless you have that 
that entire focus of why and you can still remain in business even though you lower your price you are going to keep on lowering your price as a tactic not as a strategy a strategy is cost leadership and when you when you get there as a cost leader then your tactic could be either i'm holding the price or i'm lowering the price as and when i require but without having one the strategy in place you aren't able to look at the back so i also have a question here from amrita who is doing the session right now she's a, she's just started off with her entrepreneurial venture and she is wanting to know that what would be the five major takeaways if you had to recommend from you know the so many other wars so many other major wars that have happened uh that an entrepreneur uh, uh, uh nascent entrepreneur she's a first generation entrepreneur if i mean yes she's a first generation entrepreneur and she wants to know what are the top five things that come to your mind that she can sort of adapt to her uh, company as well so her, i think her business is into a clothes line she started a clothes line for yeah. women and men both together okay good good but uh, you know uh, anju i'm not going to give her five for free uh, so uh, You know, if you want five, then maybe we could meet at Starbucks sometime. And, uh, <laughs> that's over the point. It would be, but uh, I'm going to give you a couple of them, right? Uh, for you to start thinking. The first that I would like you to uh, definitely uh, work on is uh, the focus that you have. And uh, companies that don't work on focus, companies that don't get into uh, uh, get their focus right, are are. Uh, will not uh, sustain themselves over a period of time so one whatever it is you got to get your focus uh, up up in place the second is uh, it may sound uh, cliche but uh, there is no substitute for hard work and which means that if you want to if you want to develop a strategy you got to put in tremendous amount of hard work in finding out what what the strategy needs to be Uh, you need to be extremely detailed in in whatever analysis that you are making because strategy uh, is uh, very simply put uh, an inflection at the decision it's a decision point that you have whether uh, you want to increase price or you don't want to increase price right at the tactical level it's a decision that you are going to take right and but that decision can't be taken unless and until there is a lot of work that you will do so the two things i think that i would like uh, you to take away is one get your focus right up in place and second is is you know the devil is in the detail as they say so get to detailing and then you will you will be able to create a good strategy for your venture good luck to you <clears throat> okay all right thank you so much amrita hope this helps you a lot as well uh, i have another question here from uh, piyush uh so piyush wants to know um as an mba aspirant there is a lot of you know there is a lot of um, i would say cloud around the fact that if you enter a company into a position of strategy it might really help you so should they be focusing on that should they be focusing on a career placement which offer the or or can they even expect as an mba aspirant who will complete their mba journey in two years time as fresh as can they even expect them to be placed in strategy roles Um, you know, I again uh, let me let me go back to the three examples on you that I gave, and if you see the common thread that has happened there is that the ones who developed that strategy were highly skilled and experienced in their area of expertise, right? So although David was not a fighter, he was an expert at the sling, and he knew. Now, if David thought that. you know he could get a sword and start fighting with the mighty uh, the lion he would not have sustained at all similarly if you look at the other two so in order to in order to start uh, your journey as a strategist you must have a fair understanding of what the business or the, the 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 market is about and therefore you must have some experience into uh, you know the the world of business you must have dirtied your hands as they say in some function or the other it doesn't matter whether you are uh, on the shop floor or you you are selling 
uh, you know, uh, soaps out uh, to the distributors or whether you are, uh, you know, uh, issuing home loan letters. But it requires you to get a sound skill in that particular area before you can move on. So there's, again, no shortcut to uh, becoming a strategist. No shortcut to strategic success. <laughs> I have a, I have a couple of questions from Lion, who says that yeah. typically in old days, strategy planning would lead to a five-year strategic mm -hmm. plan. And how have timelines changed or rather gotten impacted in view of the speed of change? So, uh, Nalin, I think, yes, uh, it, it, that there, has been, there has been a change. So, uh, the Nehruvian five-year plans which you had even in governance uh, seems to be uh, you know, re-looked at. You, you, as you move into an environment that's more dynamic, uh, an environment that is, uh, you know, keeps on changing very rapidly, uh, it is difficult for us to, you know, focus on the theory. But let's look at it uh, from a strategic perspective. That's the vision uh, and the mission that the organization creates. And that still is a long-term uh, perspective that one needs to have. So yes, uh, at a strategic level, one needs to look at, uh, you know, a couple of years and, and take a stock every year on where we are in terms of what we had thought we would be and where we actually are and then try and rework. So uh, that planning needs to be done. But at the same time, it does not necessarily mean that you lose focus of the five years or the 10 years that you want it to be. Else, we would not be having uh, the great companies that we are seeing uh, over the last uh, you know, hundreds of years. You, know, you see IBM, you see uh, some of the great companies uh, here you know, who've sustained for a long period of time. <clears throat> Right. Thank you, sir. And now I have from one friend to the other uh, from Professor Dabani. He's asked, should strategy and tactics be pre-planned or can they be created or evolved as the going gets tough? Yes. Uh, so, so uh, Bharat, sir, I think uh, uh, there are there are there is a two-fold answer that I would like to uh, give. And, and one fold is uh, that since strategy and tactics are both separate from each other, uh, therefore, one cannot get uh, a timeline on uh, the same timeline for both of them because tactics is is is, is something that you would do uh, depending on the competitive move and on on uh, at that point of time. Whereas a strategy is a well thought through uh, process that uh, you would create. Strategy is generally uh, pre-planned, must be pre-planned. Like I said, you cannot. Uh, you know, I mean, we see this happening in, in today's uh, business world. You, you have uh, lots of slogans that CEOs make, right? lots of jargons. You know, they come on the stage and they start dancing and they say, motivate my employees and I'm sure that's the way, you know, things are going to happen. Boss, that's not going to lead you to success in the marketplace. There needs to be effort. There needs to be work. There needs to be uh, uh, a clear understanding of where you want to be in. Right? So uh, to answer that, Bharat sir, strategy needs you to look at the future, needs you to do detailing, needs you to plan and think. Uh, tactics, you will start, uh, you know, depending on where uh, you are at that point of time. So I hope that answers uh, the question. <clears throat> I'm sure, and I think we're just about in time to conclude the session as well. Um, and I think I have one more question. Do I have no yes? But it's so just there. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Mankat, for such a wonderful session as well. Thank you. And Thank I, you. like I mentioned, like I mentioned earlier as well, I couldn't have asked for a better session to end the masterclass. Meeting. For all of our attendees, uh, you can access the recording of this session in case if you'd like to go through it or even our previous sessions. Quite a few of you have been part of our masterclass journey over the last few months. And I profusely thank you for that. I hope the learning interventions have been useful to you. You've been able to adapt them into your lives as well, whether you're preparing for an MBA, whether you're you know, working in a workspace as well. Either ways, I hope they've been helpful for you as well. Uh, you can access the recording on our YouTube page. I'm just putting down the links for the same uh, on the chat box. And I hope and wish to see you guys in other learning interventions across the as well. Thank you so much. And thank you, Professor Ranka, once again. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Anju. And thanks to everyone who listened so patiently.
have a good evening and a great weekend ahead